is Laura in Austin, Texas, and you're listening to Luke Russell and Susanna Berger discussing a progressive judiciary on two broad talking politics. Hi everyone, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, and today we are going to talk about something uh, that I don't think we've ever talked about on the podcast before, and that is the judiciary. So I am joined, since I am not an expert in this, I am joined by a a couple of people to help us figure this out a little bit. So joining me today is Luke Brussel, who is an attorney and a professor of law at the Fordham University Law School. Hi, Luke. Hello, how are you? Great. And also joining us is Suzanne Berger, who is an attorney and is the chair of the Greenberg Democratic Committee. Hi, Suzanne. Good morning. So I am thrilled you guys are joining me because I will admit that this is a subject that I know very little about. And it's it's one of the subjects that every time someone starts talking about the judiciary, I think I should know a lot more about that. And it just makes me scared that I don't. And then I tune out. So today we're going to dig in and, and help us all figure out a little bit more about this and, and why we should care so very much. So maybe just to start, you guys could could tell me a little bit about, you know, how you got interested in thinking more about the judiciary and and wanting to make sure everyone could sort of understand a little more about it. I I think for me, there are two answers to that question. One is we've seen more and more of a political focus on the judiciary, particularly the federal judiciary, but also on some state courts where they have elected judges and money has started to come into those elections. And as that began to be reported in the press, it made me reflect on the pipeline for those judges and how we should evaluate what makes a good judge and a fair judge. And secondly, as a political matter in New York, we do elect many judges. And in large part, it's a political party process to uh, be a sort of gatekeeper for candidates. And it's made me evaluate personally, as I interview people who are interested, what characteristics in a person's professional experience and their temperament and demeanor might make a good judge. Uh, Because simply being a great lawyer or a skilled orator is not the sole qualification for the job. Very true. For me to speak, in this particular historic moment has taken on greater prominence um, because as a co-equal branch of government with the executive and the legislature, it's the courts that should be um, and historically largely have been independent of partisanship in terms of the decisions of the courts, and it's the courts that have um, the final say in the constitutionality and the um, permissibility of executive actions. And as we see democracy in America at certainly the most ten- in the most tenuous position in my lifetime, it's for me the courts that are the ultimate guardians of the democratic of democratic institutions and ultimately democracy in America. So I think for me it's taken on um greater importance. It's also been certainly before I'd say before law school even and certainly in law school for me the the fact that one is the courts hold this co equal power with the other two branches, the great government power. But at the same time um, courts affect people's lives in such a personal and direct way every day. And as somebody who grew up with, um, in poverty and with a sense of not a lot of power within society, for me, especially this being in the 70s and at a time of progressive, uh, a progressive judiciary and um, progress in judicial construction, the courts were something I, I felt as a kid and then ultimately was able to understand uh, intellectually as a forum where a unique forum where um, power was leveled 
between the wealthiest and the most powerful and those without wealth and um, power in society, or at least should be. Uh, we've seen it doesn't always turn out that way all too often. But for me, those are that's what makes it such an important thing to be looking at now and, and taking action with and trying to shape it. Suzanne mentioned earlier that, you know, in, in some places, judges are elected. Of course, we know that some judges are appointed. Maybe we could get sort of a an overview picture of what, uh, you know, I realize that's a really big topic, but, <laughs> you know, what, what are federal courts? What are state courts? How do judges come to be on these courts? I know there's a, a variety of ways that happens uh, across the states, but but just sort of a, a, a picture to get it, help us get a sense of, you know, orientation when we're talking about this. Federal judges are appointed. They have life tenure with the advice and consent of the Senate of the United States. Uh, state judges arrive on the bench in a variety of ways. In, in New York, we have a mixed system. Some judges are elected. Some judges are appointed. And the appointing authority might vary from municipality to municipality. I think that uh, electing, I'm probably in a minority here, but I do think that electing judges is a positive thing. We have not seen, at least in this state, a lot of money pouring into these elections from special interests, in part because our highest court, which we call the Court of Appeals in New York, is not elected. We elect our lower level judges but the uh, governor appoints the members of the Court of Appeals from a group selected by a commission. But when we let merit be the appointment, merit is in the eye of the appointer, so that when we had particular governors or presidents over the years, the bench tends to look more white and male than at other times. When we've elected judges, at least here in this state, we tend to have a much more diverse judiciary. And I think that judges, whether they like running for election or not, learn a lot by meeting the people in the jurisdictions that they are going to be representing and hearing what their concerns are, because judges are, for the most part, lawyers, and they tend to hang out with other lawyers. (laughs) And it's a good idea for them to... uh, go to uh, the VFW and to other organizations and hear what their concerns are, just like any elected official, so that when they're on the bench, they have more empathy. People who appear in courts look for empathy in judges. They don't so much care about the specifics of the ruling. They like to win, but they like to feel they've been heard. And that's something we should look for in judges, and I think the process of electing them trained judges to do that. That's an, yeah, that's an excellent point. I, I would say I'm more agnostic on how their cho- judges are chosen and more focused on um, what the criteria and basis is for choosing judges, uh, irrespective of who is doing the choosing, whether it's the governor um, or it's the voters or uh, you know, any, any other body and certainly New York's Byzantine (laughs) laws or any number of uh, institutions that wind up choosing the judges. Um, And in other states, there are direct, unlike in New York, there are direct elections for the highest court in the state. Uh, In many other states, we've seen recently in Wisconsin, very prominent elections, of course, in uh, Alabama, Roy Moore was elected to the highest court of that state, the state Supreme Court some time back. And in Wisconsin, uh, not this last year, but the year before, for the first time in a generation, a very progressive woman was elected to the Supreme Court of Wisconsin running on an anti-corruption platform. And that was one of the, the highest profile races in, in, in the state of Wisconsin in, in that year. But the tide turned, I think, this, this, this year or the next election, a very conservative judge was then elected to that court. But it does differ from from state to state. It, 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 and, it, yeah, and it also, certainly does. And it is it requires an informed electorate, too, to yes. get good judges. And so it requires uh, education of the electorate so that they understand that they can make a difference and vote for judges who may reflect their 
opinions, their special interests, uh, yes. whatever. And the the right in this country, the conservatives um, have been much more active and focused on the criteria for their judges, which judges, which people they want to um, move forward and mentor um, and help their careers and to the point where they're put on, on the judiciary. And they have, um, that is one of their highest priorities and has been for 20 to 30 years. And that has not been true uh, so much on the left um, or in the, the Democratic Party. What has not been true is that um, a focus on finding and cultivating a deep bench of progressives to be on the court and ultimately having a progressive judicial philosophy, which is different than an outcome based approach. They're going to rule this way or that way on a particular case or, or topic, but a progressive philosophy, um, just like the, the right has a, a very clear view of what's a conservative judicial philosophy and moves that forward. And that is the key criteria for them and to the point where they literally have a list of people who hold that philosophy, who they want to move forward, which that list was then uh, neatly used by the Trump administration to choose all of their the federal judges that they've put forward so far. But we haven't seen that kind of um, movement on the left. And I think that now, um, both because of the urgency of the political moment and the fact that the conservative movement intellectually, I think, has really lost its steam um, and there is an opening uh, for a, a more uh, rigorous and um, ultimately successful progressive legal movement. The conservatives have focused not only on ideology, litmus test, originalism, but also on age. True. And they have made it a point to try to uh, uh, put on the bench lawyers in their 30s and 40s. We have often put older judges, older persons on the bench who have had more experience, life experience, professional experience. Very true. And that was always seen as a qualification that people have tried many cases, um, worked in different arenas, seen both sides of a criminal court mm -hmm. trial, that sort of thing that only comes with years in service. That is not um looked upon with value anymore because if you get somebody with the ideology and you can keep them on the bench for 30 years that's better than getting somebody with experience who will only be there for 10. true in federal court with lifetime appointments that's right. yes in some state courts uh, or at many state courts there is it is not a lifetime uh, tenure. So in New York State, the Supreme Court, which is the trial court in New York, fourteen years. Just to make things confusing, yeah. is fourteen years. Not it's not. But in effect, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know the last time a sitting judge lost a re-election campaign in New York for the state Supreme Court. But I'm sure it happened. Uh, actually, in the last five years or so, a couple of Republican judges have lost oh, that in makes the sense. suburban right. counties. That makes sense. Yes. I want to come back to what a progressive philosophy uh, would look like, but I, let's talk for a moment about the, the conservative side. So there's been a lot of hand-wringing about how Trump has totally upended, changed the Republican Party and what Republican Party stands for. Is that true as well of the conservative judiciary? Has that changed over time to, to reflect the same kind of values that, that Trump and his administration have? I always thought of a conservative judiciary as being the former prosecutor. To me, that was a conservative right. Republican appointment. Sure. They came out and they did not have defense side experience or civil experience. That was my naive assumption before. That's no longer true. Uh, a conservative judge now is somebody who doesn't think the court has any role to play in mediating how society operates. That, or uh, largely so, and but certainly a, a very uh, to the extent that they see a role, um, it's very specific and limiting of uh, of progress because they see the Constitution as fundamentally 
to be read as if we are now living uh, at the time of the enactment of the Constitution or the amendment, whatever amendment that issues. So the realities of society, either society or the words, depending on which school of originalism you're from, um, should guide how the Constitution is interpreted now. I should clarify that uh, the conservative philosophy is not to mediate societal relations, but that doesn't stop them from involving themselves in individual actions. Yes, they're, they're they're very choosy about about that. Um, so I would say that you know Trump came into the, um, the political scene at a point in time where, as we were talking about a moment ago, the the conservative or right wing um, judicial uh, right wing judicial philosophy and bench the bench of potential judges already existed. And he adopted, I believe, during the campaign, vowed to, um, and then has stayed true to his word, um, appoint or nominate judges that come from a group called the Federalist Society, which has been around. It was um, founded in 1982. Right, this is the uh, the Reagan era when the right really, the the new right really came forward in the judiciary. And they had already had a very deep pinch. Um, and he has largely deferred to the Federal Society um, and their supporters, which are – there is a very developed network of um, not only the Federal Society, but think tanks at universities and um, the certain law schools where the right-wing conservative judges um, are – are cultivated and it's funded by um, largely by industry and corporate interests, you know, some more than others, and um, pushing an agenda of deregulation, et cetera. Um, law and economics is a particular brand of their philosophy as well. And so, so to answer Trump's impact, it's not been so much his own thinking on it, um, but because of the power he he holds, he is now on track to appoint 30% of the entire United States federal judiciary. And so that is a sub substantial remaking of the judiciary. And remember that there are still um, some judges uh, with a lifetime appointment for all federal judges uh, from that were appointed by Reagan. Uh, and then, of course, by in both Bush administrations. Um, and so the the majority of the federal courts will be Republican appointed judges, and the majority of those will be Trump appointed judges who are, um, I would say, more certainly more uniformly doctrine uh, conservative slash right wing activist judges than were appointed by uh, either Reagan or um Bush, Bush the father or Bush the son. They certainly appointed judicial actors Scalia and Thomas and um, a number of other judges of different different parts of the conservative legal movement. Um, but that's pretty much, with a couple of exceptions um, for really political favors, that is uh, what Trump is doing is appointing those doctrinary uh, right wing judges, and they will be the largest by far, group of judges in the federal judiciary, and they do tend to be young, and they will be there a long time, and, and they do have an And agenda. the question is, now that they have life tenure, will they continue to adhere to what uh, they've been taught, or will they broaden their views um, because some of their colleagues or litigants come before them and they have a broader exposure to facts and, and law? And that remains to be seen. That is true. I would. I also. I tend to think, and maybe and hopefully time will prove me wrong. But if you come to the role um, with a very defined, um, developed judicial philosophy, um, rather uh, than sort of, I've got conservatism as a prosecutor and law and order, but you're based on sort of case to case. You'll you'll see it as it comes. Um, if you come to it with a, a really developed philosophy, that's harder, is less likely and harder to undo um, through experience. But as Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes says, uh, law is not 
at least to his view, and I believe it, uh, is not made for, by logic. It's made by experience. The law comes from experience. And certainly we've seen judges, even on the Supreme Court, change over time and um, quite significantly. So is there anything that that we can all do as citizens? Uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about calling your representatives to, to help inform them about what people would like to see. Is there anything you can do about judges? Should there be anything you can do about, about judges and how they're ruling? Elect a Democratic Senate. For sure. <laughs> because it is uh, the Senate that confirms the judges right now, the Republicans have free reign. Uh, they've been uh, forced to withdraw a handful of nominees who were over the top embarrassing uh, to a particular senator or so forth. But uh, otherwise, there's no real uh, committee partisanship. They've done away with the old Senate tradition of blue slips where the home state senator can weigh in on the appointment at the home state. Like in New York, we have two Democratic senators, so they don't want any input. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so the, so that would be the number one thing. Um, make sure we have a majority in the Senate come 2020 and let your senators know uh, now that it's important that they uh, have uh, committee meetings and hearings that scrutinize the qualifications and bring to light some of the writings and philosophies of these judges because exposure, sunshine, whatever, can change some people's views who aren't really paying attention when they hear sometimes some of these extreme writings that have happened. I would just add also the with uh, 100%, um, but also especially given that the federal judiciary, no matter who wins the Senate and the presidency in 2020, is going to be dominated by the right for for a considerable period of time. I myself am interested in getting involved in much more uh, in who we elect as state judges. But every state also has a constitution, um, and states, uh, most many states elect judges, some directly, some indirectly. But that's in, in the states, people have can have uh, a direct role in who, who choosing who who are who the judges are, and it has been an area that um, that people by and large don't real haven't really been involved in in the past. Even people who are um, activists outside the Democratic or Republican Party um, um, institutions haven't really been involved except for voting. And that's an area where, you know, it's one of the three co-equal branches, um, and it has such an effect on people's lives and, and our laws. Uh, and that's, a, that's an area where people can have a real, tangible, immediate effect on the judiciary. And as we were talking about the the right having cultivated a very deep bench of potential federal judges that they can look to as soon as they um, are in position to nominate, like when Trump was elected, um, the, the left, whether it's the Democratic Party, outside the Democratic Party, um, has not really cultivated a deep bench of progressive judges and really um, had judges who are defining uh, what it means to be a progressive judge at this point in time. Um, and by electing state judges who are progressives and who will build a judicial, progressive judicial philosophy that uh, reflects on and effects the um, realities of America now, um, that will not only make a change at the state level immediately, um, but it also sets the the left, the prog progressives, on course to make a much more significant difference when, in fact, they're in position to uh, control the federal judiciary again. It's all about the pipeline. Pipeline. <laughs> so what would a this progressive judicial philosophy look like? You know, you've mentioned that. What what sorts of things, you know, and that doesn't necessarily 
indicate how you would rule on a, a particular thing, but what would that philosophy sort of mean or look like? So different people have different views of this and certainly different emphasis on on different aspects of it. I think that historically, and I think is true now, um, that at a constitutional level, progressives believe that the Constitution should be interpreted to uh, reflect and bear on uh, the realities of society at present, in contrast to so-called originalists who believe the Constitution is, is fixed and concrete at the moment that it was enacted, and we just have to see what was practiced at the time and apply it strictly in the present. Um, in the past, it had that view had been called the living constitution, but certainly um, it means that there is a room within the constitution and framework of our country uh, for progress. And uh, interpreting the Constitution true to the principle, the original principles of the Constitution as they were written, uh, applying that um, in a meaningful way to the realities of the present. I think that's a cornerstone. I also think that, at least for me, seeing the courts as a neutral forum um, that levels power in a way that no other institution in government does between the powerful and the powerless and the wealthy and the poor, those without great wealth. Um, that is how it's supposed to be, blind, blind justice. Um, all too often it's not so. And I believe that uh, a progressive priority should be to um, ensure that neutral forum for, for all before the court. The third leg may be opening the courthouse doors as opposed to closing them, mm. uh, and that comes about in a variety of ways, but it can come about in interpreting statutes and who's entitled to sue under sure. the statute or the emolument That's clause, very true. Or whatever, and, and the uh, statute of limitations issues, and, and there are issues that are not crystal clear in legislation and if you have a philosophy that people should be able to come and redress, that seek redress of rights and obligations, you may interpret something to be more open than not. Absolutely, and that courts have have a role to play in that, mm -hmm. right? Not not viewing the courts as very limited in its jurisdiction, but more broadly. Before we wrap up, I want to, of course, acknowledge that just yesterday, a former Supreme Court justice, John Paul Stevens, died at 99 years old. You know, there was, a, I think, a moment of panic among people thinking this was a current justice and we would have another Supreme Court fight on our hands. Can you just speak briefly to sort of his legacy on the court? Sure. So he was, you know, as Suzanne was saying before, in terms of the how some judges can evolve, I think he's he's one of the great examples of the 20th and into the 21st century. Um, he was a, a Republican antitrust lawyer and was appointed to the court and ultimately became, if not the absolute leader, certainly the linchpin of liberalism on the court that evolved over time. I certainly think of him, when I think about him for his, um, as somebody who just expresses and emanates a kind of empathy and kindness, you know, that always stood out for me in listening to him. Um, a couple of the his, the opinions that he wrote, one was in the um, Rumsfeld suit uh, around Guantanamo Bay and the, those who were captured in the war on terror after 9-11, where uh, the, the, the the key aspect of his opinion was that the executive branch, the president and those under him um, or her, as the case may be, are bound to comply with the rule of law, that there's limits to executive power, even in the time of war or armed disputes. Um, and that that limitation, I think, and the clarity of his articulation of it, I think, um, sort of is a, urgently important in this particular moment. I would just say that he is not someone who you would think would rule because of who was asking him to make the ruling, but For sure. but to look at the facts and circumstances and what law and society required. 
Absolutely. Well, Luke and Suzanne, I want to thank you so much for for coming on and talking to me. This has uh, definitely been a clarifying conversation for me, and I I hope it will be for a lot of our listeners as well. If people want to make sure they're sort of keeping up on what's going on with the judiciary, who's being appointed for these federal positions, you know, is there a particular Twitter feed or or news organization that you would recommend that they, they watch? Sure. So everyone's free to follow me on Twitter. But for I think the the best uh, source would be the American Constitutional Society, which is on Twitter to add uh, ACS law or just Google ACS. And that is um, the largest national um, progressive judicial and legal network. I'd say loosely they are the progressive federalist society and um, they they hold um, excellent informative newscasts and in-person events, um, and their their website is a great resource for the progressive community in terms of the judiciary and, and both legal current events and the law. Excellent. We'll make sure to put uh, links up to that so people oh, can, can find it. So thank you so much for speaking with me. And, uh, you know, I hope as there's more issues in the judiciary that come up, maybe we'll have you back on at some point, certainly if, God forbid, another <laughs> Supreme Court justice seat opens up. <laughs> My pleasure. Been fun. Yeah, thank you so much. My pleasure as well. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wethlin and was created for use by this podcast.